He's a, he's a very good student. And he's uh, becoming a master. A good student, not a much teacher. <laughs> not remembered much. But I'm here. He's becoming a, a master teacher. Jim. Uh, yes. My daughter Amanda wrote down a question. I guess she was reading Isaiah 65, 17, and she asked, is it talking about when God recreates the earth after rapture, tribulation, and Armageddon? Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. Oh, it says, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will okay. create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people to joy. Okay. okay, you can find this also in Second Peter 3.13. And it goes from the second coming of the Lord, and it jumps the whole thousand year reign of Christ over to here. When he creates a new heaven and a new earth. <coughs> Alright, so this... There's, a, there's times in the Bible when Jesus came the first time, when he came to this earth as our Savior. John the Baptist had quite a bit of trouble. John the Baptist was a forerunner, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Alright, John the Baptist uh, said that uh, <coughs> that one that comes after me, I'm, I'm clearing the way for one that comes after me. He said, I'm not worthy to tie or untie his shoes. And then when he saw Jesus, which, by the way, was his cousin, mm -hmm. when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And this is he who I talk about. And then when he was in prison, he, he had been put in prison. And uh, uh, he had been studying the Old Testament scriptures, hadn't he? That's what he was preaching. <coughs> All right? He was preaching righteousness and, the, and judgment and the coming of the Lord. And he said, Behold, the kingdom of God is near. Well, the king was there. And the kingdom of God was right among you. And he got confused. Here was a great man of God, a great prophet of God, but he was confused about the scriptures. And how in the world could he, a prophet of God, get confused? Well, Jesus, uh, he figured, and a lot of Israel figured, that when Jesus came that he was going to bring in his kingdom and set it up, I mean, with power and force. Because he's a God of heaven and this is Jehovah in the flesh. Now, we're studying the lesson about God. Is God all-powerful? What limits God? What limits God? His own self. His own words limit him. Why didn't Jesus set up his kingdom right then? Because we are the things he had to do. <laughs> we would, but still lost, would we? Yeah. yeah. All right, he had to die first. The Bible said that he had to become our substitute first before he could set up that kingdom. And uh, John was confused. John the Baptist. All right, not John the Apostle, but John the Baptist. And he sent word by his disciples to Jesus. And he said, I'm confused. I'm not. I don't understand why you haven't set up the kingdom or anything. Are you the one, or shall we look for another Messiah? And Jesus said what? Tell him what I'm doing. I'm healing the blind. I'm preaching the gospel to the poor, etc. All right? And he said, uh, that's what he told him. And then what was the Messiah supposed to do? that very same thing. Except that he saw him setting up his thousand year reign of the kingdom. He thought this was supposed to happen right then. The early church, the early churches, let's put it that way, plural, that were scattered throughout all the country. Paul wrote first and second Corinthians, he wrote first and second uh, Thessalonians. And in those letters he put some things about Eschatology. Eschatology. What does eschatology mean? Study of last things. Study of last things or end times. Okay? Now, we had a, a group of people that were preaching end times that split off from main Judaism 
and they were down by the Dead Sea. Maybe even two groups down there. We don't know for sure from the evidence that we have. There were, those were the Essenes and the Qumranians. Now, they could be the same, or they could be two different groups. But they talked about the end times right then. They, were, they looked for a terrible end times coming, and that they looked for a Messiah. Also, to, to, to come back, to actually, who they were looking for was Michael, the archangel, to come back and protect them from this evil stuff. All right? Now, this is uh, what they believe. Now, these philosophies and this, this doctrine had spread throughout all the land. Well, John was preaching down there basically in the same area, wasn't he? And he was reading Old Testament scriptures, and sometimes Old Testament scriptures, when Jesus stood up in uh, Nazareth and was preaching in the synagogue where he was accustomed to going, he preached and stopped right in the middle of a verse. What? To tell him that he's fulfilled. That, well, that verse was fulfilled. The rest of it was not going to be fulfilled until here. Right there. Tense, yeah. All right. <coughs> you have to learn how to rightly divide the truth. Brother John sent me an open paper in the, in the mail the other day, John Gage, that I sure appreciated so much. He sent me a note and said, uh, thank you so much for rightly dividing the word of truth and giving us the, the, the gospel and the truth of God's word. He said, I so appreciate it. He told me many times uh, that he appreciates so much sitting in this class because he never got to go into any advanced theology classes in seminar. He said, this is just absolutely wonderful. It's a gold mine, jewels and things in there. He said, I just love it. I don't you do too. <laughs> but you need to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. And John, the Baptist, did not understand that then. And he said, are we supposed to look for another Messiah? All right. So right here in Isaiah... For it says in Isaiah that, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall be remembered or come to mind. That's jumping all the way ahead past the thousand year reign of Christ for the new heavens and the new earth. The destruction of earth and a new heaven and a new earth. Second Peter 3, 10 through 13. Revelation 21 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. And Isaiah, also Isaiah uh, 65 and verse 17. Isaiah well, was writing that is almost 4,000 years into the future. Yes. That's what we read here in 65. At least that much. <laughs> <laughs> At least 4,000 years. Is that Second Peter what verse? What? Is that what verse? Uh, 2 Peter. On your little chart now, you'll have 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13. And I want to make sure that you've got some because I made some of those this week. All right. And it'll tell you right on this. Do you have... Does anyone need one of these? You like one in cup. All right. I don't like the way this is set up, but this is the only way I can do it with the machine I have. We wouldn't do it. Anyone else need, need one of those? Son, you have one of these? Anybody? All right. Well, Bill, you need one back there? You've got about everything I ever printed, though. All right. You know, Jim, uh, John the Baptist, when uh, he, I'm not going to say he lost faith or he uh, was questioning. You don't know what he was going through in that prison because he had just been a, a great witness to the Lord and Satan uh, was going to shut him up at all costs. And uh, he, <coughs> the guy could have been half starved and, I mean, yeah. you know, and going through a lot of stuff yeah, but when he says, look, we're supposed to be going into this kingdom. Maybe. Yeah. Well, just like, remember when we studied the, the book or the lesson of the Bible. Mm -hmm. There was a question in there. It says, did the prophets understand everything that they wrote? Mm -hmm. No, they didn't. Now, here we have a great prophet of God. If Jesus said there's no greater prophet ever walked the face of this earth than John the Baptist. 
But did John the Baptist understand everything he preached? Now, he was preaching by inspiration, wasn't he? But did he personally understand everything that he preached? No. And here we have a, an absolute uh, perfect example of that. Have a brother. Perfect. Yeah, the other thing, uh, we have the ability to understand more right now than the greatest theologians did 50 years ago. Amen. I mean, but it's being revealed that fast. We have seen things fulfilled. Uh, you know, did John the Baptist have all the Bible? No. no, he didn't have any of the New Testament, did he? <laughs> None. <laughs> he didn't have any of the New Testament. Period. The New Testament, first of all, we we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that were eyeballing the situation. Right then. They were looking and seeing. And later on, they would write the four Gospels. And then the letters. Uh, we have the book of Acts, and which is another historical. We have, you know, we have quite a few of the historical accounts of what happened in the times of Jesus. We have Philo, we have Josephus, and we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. That's all, those are all history books. Now we have five of those books that are inspired. Josephus and, and Philo were not inspired. And then we also have the, uh, Arco. the Arco volume. Those are legal records that took place during that time. We have all of these records. But the inspired record is the Word of God, because these men were writing by inspiration. Okay? And God directing them, and we're going to see, and we're, going, we're, we're studying the lesson number three uh, on page number four, which is God. Okay? And we're understanding about God, we're going to understand about the Holy Spirit, because we're going to study the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. And I can't remember which one it is. That we're going to study the Trinity and then the Holy Spirit. Yeah. All right? <clears throat> but we'll understand a little bit more about it. But today, you have a license to learn like none of them ever did because so much of that is fulfilled. John was living right then. He was in a prison, horrible treatment, uh, looking forward to being killed. All right? And... Under a great depression, I'm sure. Starvation and everything else. But he didn't have any of the New Testament. He didn't even know what was going to happen to Jesus in all reality. He did not see the difference between this coming and this kingdom age and the end of the kingdom age. He didn't know. He couldn't clarify anything. We've got a chart here that I've handed out to you. You've got a chart in your hand that you can you can take your Bible and as you become more and more familiar with it... Hello, Brother Rich. Hello there. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I just say Merry Christmas to all of you? I'm running around and saying hi to all my classes today because I'm always teaching during this hour. All right. So I just want to take a second and say Merry Christmas to all of you. You guys have a great holiday season. Merry Christmas to you. As you study, and I hope, I told I tell the Greek class that I teach on Wednesday and they teach this all year round, by the way. It doesn't and as they hand out the flyers and we have the discipleship classes, they have thirteen weeks or sixteen weeks or nineteen weeks. Well the class that I teach on Wednesday night goes all year long. And I do teach Greek, advanced reading and research in Greek. But I teach you the Bible. That's the most important thing. I've never ever studied Greek or Hebrew, either one or Latin or German or any of those languages. It had to be an absolute necessity to bring out the original language from the Word of God. And we study that. And we absolutely dissect scientifically the Word of God. And I told them in that class, I said, don't be afraid to learn Greek. You know, that's supposed to be one of the hardest languages in the world to, to, to study. But I said, don't be afraid of it. <laughs> Because we're going to learn it by induction, by doing it. We're going to learn it by doing it. We're on number three. I had a couple of Bible questions for him, Brother John. When you take this chart, you can open up your Bible. 
Sometimes you've got Bibles that have helps in them, study Bibles and everything that tell you a little bit. But look at this chart, and you'll know more than John the Baptist did. <laughs> or Isaiah. Or Ezekiel. Or Daniel. You'll understand it better. And you won't have to have an angel sent to you like Daniel did. All right? You will be able to rightly divide the word of truth. And thank you, Brother John, for that little note. I appreciate you know, it very much. You know, Jim, an amazing thing to do is there will be no more revelation. I mean, we've got it all right here. Well, we do have it. There are people today in churches that teach that they have continued revelation from God. They never church. People, we have had it. <laughs> we have the revelation of God. We don't need any more, by the way. Is the Word of God perfect? When we studied the, the lesson on the Bible, is it perfect? Is the man of God thoroughly furnished unto and for and to bring about every good work? Ever, absolutely. Man of God is perfectly furnished with the Word of God. You don't need anything else. It's done. It is finished. And we more, know more than John the Baptist or Isaiah or even Moses. Because we have the complete Word of God. And none of those people have all of the Word of God like you. People are still looking for revelation. I, I, how many have you ever known a person that was praying for guidance from God? And they just take their Bible and go, and there is the answer. Judas went and hanged himself. Go out and do my part. I tell you what, that's not the right way to rightly divide the word truth. I mean, it isn't. Don't get into that. Now, that's superstition. That's all. That's uh, uh, rolling the dice. Learn to rightly divide the Word of God because it'll take you a lifetime. Norm and I learned the hard way years and years ago one time not to pray for signs, too. Because you can interpret whatever you want to fit whatever you want. And that's not a good thing. This, you can pray for God's guidance. And study the Word of God to find out what He wants for you in your life. We, so many times, people <coughs> have great ambitions for themselves. But every ambition should be centered around what God wants with your life too. If you're a carpenter, be the best carpenter there is and be a great Christian carpenter. If you're a real estate agent, be the best one. If you're a doctor, be the best doctor that you can be. If you're a scientist, be the best scientist that you can be. And <coughs> give God the glory. If you're a psychologist, take him into every session you take that you have. And glorify God for it. I, was, I went to my family doctor here a while back. And this is top this off when we get right back to this. I went to my family doctor. And he said, you know, he said, everything I learned in medical school is absolutely wrong. They taught us that, uh, you know, watch out for cholesterol. Don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat this. And we, he said, we've come up with all kinds of artificial things. And he said, the American Medical Association has absolutely made everybody sick in America. <laughs> We're sick and disease because of bad philosophy. He said, you can't improve on what God made. He said, butter is really not bad for you. Whole milk is really not bad for you. Eggs are good for you. And he said, all of them. Not just the egg whites. <laughs> he said, all of it. He said, eat some of all of that. Watch your diet and everything you do. But he said, and eat a lot of vegetables. He said, God gave you the vegetables. And eat them like they, they are. Don't try to do some weird thing with them in some package and freeze it. And whatever, you know. He said, this is killing us. He said, you need these things. And he said, vitamins and things are very important. But the best way to get them is with real food. Not artificial food. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? 
I knew what I was doing. Was God still is the master of the universe, mm -hmm. and he knew what he was doing back then. And even now in the 21st century that we live in, God still knows what's best for us. You want to learn hygiene? Study the books that Moses wrote. It's really important. If you want to study dietary habits and science, study that. If you want to, if you want to understand archaeology, first of all, be familiar with the Word of God. It will get you on the right path. You won't go out there in the twilight zone someplace, groping, because you'll know what. Remember, we went through the Dark Ages once with we? Mm -hmm. And what caused the Dark Ages? The removal of the Word of God from the hands of the world. And people became ignorant. While the Catholic Church even said the world was flat. The Bible didn't say that. Well, their popes did. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't teach you that. The Bible teaches you that the Bible is part, or, 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 that the world, the, the earth is part of a whole cosmic system, a cosmos. And that the earth is basically round. And that it spins. And that there's cycles in the heavens. You know that there's there's summer and fall and spring or winter and spring. And there are seasons. And this is how all of these stars rotate and how far the sun is from the earth and all that. And the moon has a lot to do with things. That's all found in the Bible. The world shut itself off from the Word of God and became in became in total darkness. All right, where did we finish off last week on lesson number three on page number four? Number four. <coughs> Was it on number four? Yeah. Okay. God has revealed Himself to man in physical manifestations, and of course we did. And let me ask you now. <coughs> we have Genesis 18. We have Exodus 3. We have Hebrews 1 and 3, Colossians 1 and 15, John 1 and 14, and I gave you also John 1 and 18. What do those scriptures, I'm asking you to read, speak to me, what do those scriptures teach? And Lee has a wonderful explanation of that. God invaded humanity. God invaded humanity. What do these scriptures teach us? In, in summary, Jesus is the image of God. Jesus is God. In the flesh. He is the image of God. What is it? It, it, we, the word icon? Icon. What does that mean? The, the striking image? Yeah, the striking image of God. He is the image of God. He is God. He is the only God that you will ever see. That is the image, the pressed out image of the invisible Godhead. The visible Godhead is who? Jesus. Alright. What does the name Jesus mean? It should be what? Joshua. Alright. It's translated incorrectly. It should be Joshua. And what does that mean? Jehovah saves. And who is Jehovah? He who shall become John 1, 14 is a fulfillment of the Jehovah title. Write that down in Delaby, right on your forehead. <laughs> Inside of it. <laughs> Write it. John 1, 14 is the fulfillment of the Jehovah title, which means he who shall become. Because God became flesh. All right? You know the song, <clears throat> We Shall Behold Him. That, that's so touching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the world has never seen Jesus in all this glory, by the way. Did you know that? Right. Moses saw him one time. He had to just you know, walk by with his eyes shut almost from glory. Moses was on the mountain uh, talking with the Lord, hiding behind a rock or whatever. And when he got down off the mountain, he scared the daylights out of those people. Why? The glory of the Lord <coughs> shone from his face, and they made him put a veil over his face. Is there a brain of it? Because of the afterglow of the image of God. Now, 
He was talking to the pre-incarnate Christ, wasn't he? All right, what's the, well, by the way, what does the word Christ mean? Christos. That's where our word comes from. What? The anointed, the anointed one. All right, the anointed one. All right, Jesus was the anointed one. The Messiah. Number five. Has there ever been a time or will there ever be a time when God does not exist? Psalm 90 and verse 2, 102 and verse 27, and Isaiah 57 and verse 15. Can someone go and look those things up? And let's, let's see what, what it means here. Has there ever been a time or will there ever be a time when God does not exist? God is eternal. Well, by necessity, God is eternal, isn't he? Somebody... Uh, as, as, how many of you got any of these scriptures yet? By necessity, God is eternal. God wouldn't be God. If you're worshiping a God that isn't eternal, you're worshiping the wrong God. Because the God of heaven is eternal. In other words, he lives forever. Brother Ken. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had form the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Alright, that's Psalm 92. Okay. Isaiah 57 verse 15. Anybody have that? Isaiah 57 verse 15. And uh, Psalm 102 also. Um, Psalm 102 or 27, but you are the same, and your ears, your ears have no end. That's right. You are the same. And your hearing is what the Hebrew says. Your listening has no end. Oh, years. Okay, years have no end. Well, he, God cannot be calculated in time. The years are time. One time, God became flesh and dwelt among us. All right. Then, 102 verse 27. Got that? Yeah. 102, verse 27. Yeah, I think that was oh, was that it? Okay, Isaiah 57, verse 15. <coughs> so you got that one, Brother Alfred? For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is Holy, I dwell in a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. All right. You know, God exists outside of time. He exists in eternity. And we've studied, and I've talked about this before. If you, if you went <coughs> at the speed of light to the first star from us, it takes about three and a half light years to get there. Or four and a half light years. And if you went there and back... A time span of about nine years would take place. Traveling at the speed of light coming back all of those years. Okay? That's a lot of miles, too. If you lived on the earth at that same period of time, if you had a twin brother on earth that was here, he would have aged over 300 years in that nine years. Because <coughs> time is absolutely relative to speed and velocity. It's, it's absolutely time is relative <coughs> to velocity and the observer. That's an absolute fact. Now, they have figured that out. Now, how fast is God going? <laughs> Faster than that. <laughs> I, just, just think about that. For, now, we know that to be a fact. So now, is it in our mi finite minds, is it possible for God to live outside the space and time? Since we know this theory, and they say it's a fact, that's Einstein's theory of relativity, you know, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared and all of that. Uh, we've studied a lot of that. And Einstein made a real weird statement one time. He said, I believe in mathematics. And I respect God. I have a reverence for God. Well, God's the God of mathematics. He didn't admit, I mean, Einstein didn't admit mathematics. You know, he flunked high school mathematics. He couldn't get a high school degree. He could not graduate from high school because he couldn't understand 
rudimentary mathematics. He was beyond it. Him looking at mathematics is boring him. But God is the God of mathematics. He's the God of science, true science. All right? Let's isn't go on. It, isn't it amazing that he knew our names before he created the earth? That's right. He knew every one of us that would ever live on this earth before he ever created one thing. That's what you call what? What's that, what's that term? Omniscience. Omniscient. God is omniscient. All right. He is om. He knows everything. Now, if he didn't know that, I heard a preacher one time preaching his uh, predestination and election and everything one time. He said, I'll tell you that God only knows what he wants to know. You know what he just did when he did that? He completely destroyed God. His God was not the God of the Bible. He completely destroyed the idea of God because God is omniscient. And when you limit God like that, God limits himself on what he does. He can't save anybody outside the blood of Jesus Christ, as you know that. God can't do it. I don't care how much he loved them, he couldn't save them outside the blood of Jesus Christ. Because he set that down in his word. As all powerful as true. God is, that, that we can do something that God can't. And I say, uh, accept him, say ourselves. Number six. <clears throat> what is the moral character of God? Number six. The moral character of God. Psalm 99 9. Uh, Isaiah 57, verse 15, Hebrews 6, 18. Okay. Now, what does the Bible say about God? Who is God? Really? Who is He? Creator. He's our Creator. Savior. Savior. Almighty. Almighty. What else? Who is He? If you had to write write one word down, I got that. That's that's it right there. Oh. Definition of <laughs> this isn't enough. I'm gonna tell you something. Our idea of love is not that that word right there. I got that. That idea of love there is that the Creator will suffer for the creation. The Creator. In God, it says that God came to the creation. And the creatures, His created things rejected Him. His creation rejected Him. The ultimate the absolute ultimate expression of his love rejected him. The birds didn't. The snakes out in the wilderness, the coyotes, the wolves, the lions, the sheep. None of those things that rejected Jesus. What was the crowning glory of the creation of God? Created on the sixth day. I want you to think about the number six. You know the Bible... Then every time when you when you when you look at the word of God, many times the number six is a very evil, evil number. How many poles did Goliath have? Huh? Six. How many fingers? Even weirdo, wasn't he? <laughs> he might even have three eyes, I don't know. <clears throat> six and six and six. What is the number of the man of sin? Six. Six, six. All right. But I want you to think mathematically about the number six for just a minute. You can do everything with the six. Did you know that? Six ones can stand independently and they can divide into each other the same way. Three times two is six. Two times three is six. All of it. You can just do all kinds of that number six. Man was created on the sixth day. And God put his whole love in that person. In the original language, it says in Hebrew, in the book of Genesis, that means the book of beginnings, 
It said God formed man as he formed the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his face and nostrils the breathings of lives. Plural, plural. <laughs> the breathings of lives. Every human being that would ever be created, ever be born in this world, that life was put in Adam. Life, the nucleus of that life was put into Adam right there. And that race, that genus of man, that creation, because God made man in his blood flowing likeness, his shadow casting image, and it says his spiritual image and his mental image. He made God, God made man like himself. And he made man special. Now he made angels, didn't he? Are angels like God? No. Are angels strong? Mm -hmm. Are they more stronger than man? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now he gave angels something that he gave man also. Spirit. Father. Spirit. Freedom and choice. Spirit. Oh, volition. Choice. Volition. God is, we hear the word sovereign though. We hear the word sovereign a lot. God is sovereign. What does the word sovereign mean? You can do what you want to do. God is sovereign. He's going to do exactly what he wants. And who is going to tell what tell God he was wrong? Well, there's a lot of people stand up and shake their fists in, in the face of God and say, oh, you're wrong. That's like the a mouse trying to stop a tractor out in the field. You know, I mean, stop. This is my home. Don't you dare run over my home. Doesn't do him much good. The tractor just keeps on rolling. God is sovereign. Now when he created angels, he gave them a little bit of sovereignty. But he didn't create them like himself. Now the angels could do what? They could either follow God or they could rebel against God. And let me give you this one biblical truth. Nothing could have ever glorified God if it had been robots. Because, I mean, a robot just does what it's told to. God made <clears throat> some of his creation sovereign like himself. Now angels are spirit. Now they take form from what we find in the Bible. But there is volition there. There is a sovereignty there. They're going to make a choice to follow God or follow God. We also have a demonia. I don't understand all I know about that situation. It means little God. God-like creatures. Supernatural creatures. We get our word in English, demon, from it. Now, demons, a little, from what I understand, is different than danger. Demons uh, don't have form. They embody things. They either look to, to live in animal or human flesh, from what we find out. That that's what we discover from the scriptures. But there's volition there. There are good spirits, and then there are bad demon spirits. And then God said that he made man as he formed the dust of the earth, to be related to it and to go to it, by the way, prophetically. This is an Hebrew book, John. It's, I mean, it takes a lot of that, studying that, to understand that. But I don't know if you've ever even heard that before, have you? He made man as he made the dust of ground to become dust. And he made him in his image. The image of the pre-incarnate Christ. The image of man that would walk on this earth. The Jesus that would walk on this earth. That's how he made it, Adam in that image. He poured all that love into him. It was like, if you look, read Matthew and you read Luke, it, you'll find out one of them is, a, is the uh, lineage of, of Mary and the other one is, a, is their kingly lineage. Matthew was a kingly lineage. 
But it says, and God, it went all the way back, and then it says, and God begat Adam. God began him. We're a direct creation right from God. We're not a secondary creation. That's another thing that, that you get from the Hebrew that you don't get in English. I want to clarify that, young lady. When God formed man, he formed him as he formed the dust in the ground, not from it. If he formed him from another object, what would he be? A secondary creation of God. But man is a primary creation of God. Where did woman come from? She came from man. That's why you don't have a responsibility. You were not created as God created man, but from man. And the word woman means out of man. Isha is the Hebrew word. Ish is man. Isha means out of man. Alright? And he created this. And this is the primary. And this is the primary responsibility. If people would study just the Hebrew, they'd get the family unit straightened out. <laughs> and you'd understand those things. Beautiful truths in God's word. Well, God made man in his image. And he was the epitome of his showing forth of love in the world, in the creation. And that creation absolutely rejected God, the creator, when he walked among them as one of them. How do you describe God? What is the moral character of God? I can say one thing. God is love. Love is God. God created all things to love. To be a recipient of His love. The Bible says that even creation itself groans. And this is something that's very beautiful too. And Brother John, write this one down in your heart. It groans for the perfecting of mankind. What has thrown the whole cosmos into a mess? Sin. Sin. But when sin is put away, when man finally becomes God's reign, reign. Well, in, in, in the end time, in eternity future, who is going to rule with Christ? His people. His bride. She will be his cold air, and she will be his absolute epitome of his love and affection, <coughs> ruling and reigning with him. That's what the creation groans for, is that perfecting. And the word perfecting doesn't mean to be perfect, but it means to come about to its end result. The Greek word is tetelio. It means the end result. When God calls you to do anything, He never calls you to do anything you, you can't do. He also provides the ability. And He wouldn't call you to do something you couldn't do. That'd be wrong, right? It's morally wrong. If He calls you to do something, He gives you the ability to do it. So in the end, it'll be a perfect match. All right. Number seven. That's the number of perfection in the Bible, by the way. Is it possible to escape from God's presence? Psalm 139, 7 through 11. Is it possible to escape from God's presence? We have one guy in the Old Testament. His name was John. The book of John in the Old Testament. Okay, John. <laughs> His name was John. And uh, God sent him to do something. And what did John try to do? Run. Run. <laughs> he, he escaped and he got on a boat. Took the boat ride. And God ordained the wind <laughs> to stop that boat ride. Then he ordained the fish to take that fellow where he was supposed to be going. Dead. <laughs> he had to kill him first to get him to do what he wanted him to do. Because where did Jonah cry from? The from the belly of Sheol. Sheol. 
the place of departing spirits. He was done for. He was dead. He died. Dead. He had left this world without doing what God had told him to do. He was on a mission. And the mission was not finished yet. He had gone the wrong direction. And even met death in it when God sent him back. <laughs> All right. I'm going to turn this over to Brother Greg in just a minute. Are they still preaching out there? <coughs> Is there anything too difficult for God to do? No. <coughs> All right. Genesis 17, verse 1. Do you want it back there in the book of beginnings? Genesis 17, verse 1. Genesis. By the way, that means that word Genesis does not come from Hebrew. That is a Greek word. And uh, what is the Hebrew word for that book? Barashit. All right. Barashit. Okay. Genesis, beginnings. Okay, Genesis 17 and verse 1. Who's got that one? You don't have that root? Now when Abram was 90 years, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I am God Almighty. Look at that. Did God lie? No. He stated that he was omnipotent. Didn't he? Mm -hmm. Now that should settle it for all of us. Right there. Because God says he's almighty. Now, <coughs> Abraham was having some second thoughts. He was having problems with it. God had made him a promise. And we find later on, and he kept down to God's ability to bring forth a child out of this old man and this old woman. He did it, didn't he? He did it. Abraham caused us a lot of trouble in the meanwhile. We're having problems with that situation right here today because of what Adam did. I'm not Adam, but Abraham. Job 42 and verse 2. And then Matthew 19, verse 26. Who's got the book of Job there? <laughs> I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. All right. Well, if you can do all things, no plan of yours can be misconstrued. God's eternal purpose. God's unpreventable progress. These things I want you to get indelibly into your minds. God's eternal purpose. God's unpreventable progress. Nothing is going to stop the will and the plans of God. Is there someone trying to do that? All right. I want you to think just for a minute. One of the greatest examples of the existence of God in the world today is the nation of Israel. Israel has got to be here in the end time because God has got a plan for them. Now, if Satan could have killed them and, and inspired men, does Satan inspire people on this earth to do things? Yes. Who's the God of this world? And, the, and it does not mean so much cosmos, but <coughs> this age. Okay? The God of this age is Satan. When Jesus came to this earth, he took him up, Satan took Jesus up to a great tall mountain, he says. And said, look out there. See all those governments and all those peoples? I can make them all fall, fall down and worship you if you will only. Or I can give them to you, all to you, if you will just worship me. Now, was he lying to me? No, he didn't do it. He had to say. You know why we have so much trouble in this world? Because if we're aliens. We're aliens. I remember I had a teacher one time, Darius Sherwood Madden. Some of you. About the Libby, he yeah. even remembers him. Great big tall Cajun about that. Tall, about that wide. Not that big around. Feet were this long. <laughs> Great big guy. <laughs> I'm on all the world with a guy. And he was down there dealing with the city of Anaheim. They had a real deep voice. And he'd always his nose run and make him sneeze when he was talking. He said, the reason for that, he says, them hairs in my nose, he said, my voice is so deep, it makes them vibrate, and then I start sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> he said he it. Anyway, he walked in there to the city fathers of Anaheim one time, and 
And he, they were giving him trouble about building this church house down there. He walked in there and he said, I'm sure glad of one thing. He said, I don't have to spend eternity with not one last one of you. <laughs> you ungodly buzzards. <laughs> he said, you're all sons of hell. <laughs> Well, Job had some hard times, did Job had some hard times in this world. Mm -hmm. You just read about it. You ought to read the book of Job at least once a year. It'll make you feel a lot better. It would. Just read the book of Job now and then. Matthew 19 and verse 26. Matthew 19 and verse 26, and I'm going to turn her over to Brother Gray. <coughs> What do we got up here? Matthew 19, verse 26. Who do we got? Got another John? And looking upon them, Jesus said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All right. You know, Jesus was telling some things. He used some hyperbole sometimes. You know what a hyperbole is? That's a Greek word. Hyper means what? Over. Have you ever heard of a hyper Okay. How about the word ball? All right, that's two, two words from that hyperbole. That means to throw way past where it's supposed to go. A hyperbole is an exaggeration. Jesus told one time, told people one time, he says, easier for a rich man to get in, or easier for a camel to go through the eye of a sewing needle. Now, Luke used the term for a surgical needle. He, he was a physician and a scientist, too, by the way. He was more of a physician. He was a, he was a scientist, a physicist, everything he was done. He was a great educated man in his day. He says it's easier for a camel to crawl and scringe and get through the eye of a surgical needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. That's pretty tough. And he said, You people strain out gnats. This is another hyperbole. He said, when they have wine, gnats would get into the wine. You know what a gnat is? The little bitty tiny flies. And they would get into their wine and they would strain it through a cloth. And then he would drink it because they didn't want to break the law by drinking a gnat because you're not supposed to eat bugs. That was against the laws of Moses. But he said, you gulp down a camel with one gulp. How many of you have ever ate a camel in one gulp? You think that's possible? You don't get them on your that's what you right call a hyperbole. Side. You know, a camel, you've got to go out and catch the rascal first. You've got to knock him in the head, skin him, and butcher him and cook him. But Jesus said, you gulp him down with one gulp. You know, the camel, you're not supposed to be eating them either. Because they don't meet the dietary <coughs> regulations of yeah, the clean yeah, animals. But I don't remember. They, they, yeah. There's one thing wrong. <laughs> Their stomach isn't right or the foot isn't right, and I can't remember which one it is right now. Thank you for your attention to that. I hope the Word of God has been a blessing to you. And uh, uh, Brother Gray, <coughs> I'll turn it over to you. Thank you.